Thousands of Eritreans enslaved in Sudan and Egypt. Iran's supreme leader marks the anniversary of the revolution on Instagram. And Mayor Rob Ford launches a new YouTube series. This is World Brief. Today we begin in Afghanistan, where the first case of polio has been recorded in the city of Kabul since 2001. The Afghan Foreign Health Ministry said the three-year-old girl is from East Kabul and was diagnosed with a disease in Pakistan, where she is now being treated. Since the Taliban government was ousted in 2001, polio had largely been contained to remote areas of Afghanistan. But Afghan Foreign Health Minister Soraya Dalil told the BBC that the Pakistani Taliban is once again undermining efforts to eradicate the disease. Afghanistan, Pakistan and Nigeria are the only countries in the world where cases of polio are still regularly recorded. However, the disease has also reared its head once again in Syria, where of course the humanitarian crisis has limited access to immunization as well as sanitary water. According to the Centers for Disease Control, a total of 23 polio cases were recorded in Syria in 2013. We go now to the Sinai Desert, where, according to Human Rights Watch, Eritrean refugees have become ensnared in a cycle of ransom, torture, rape, and murder. According to a 79-page Human Rights Watch report released on Tuesday, Egyptian and Sudanese smugglers have been taking Eritrean refugees prisoner with the compliance of government officials since 2010. Human Rights Watch spoke to hundreds of refugees. Listen to what a few had to say. Pick up, Human Rights Watch researchers also spoke to one trafficker who admitted to torturing refugees and earning more than $200,000 in profit in one single year. Activists said that the failure of government officials in both Egypt and Sudan to prosecute traffickers violates the United Nations Convention Against Torture. The Sinai Desert has in recent years become a dead end for Christian refugees from Eritrea who are seeking freedom from persecution inside their own country. However, the border of Israel has recently been secured by a 150-mile-long steel fence, and a new open-air prison facility has been built in the Negev Desert for African asylum seekers. More than 30,000 African asylum seekers have taken to the streets of Tel Aviv in recent uh, weeks and months, frankly, uh, to protest uh, demanding that they be recognized as official refugees. Now we head to Yemen, where President Mansour announced Monday that the country will break up into a federation of six regions. Now this is the final map for the Federal Republic of Yemen. It was decided just one day before the third anniversary of Yemen's uprising in Taiz. But the Houthis, a powerful clan in the north that has not signed off on the new map, claim the process was flawed. And the reactions in Yemen are mixed. Take a listen. Six regions is better than two regions, one in the south and one in the north. But the question is whether the government will be able to manage the resources and oil wealth to provide for all these regions. This is what we are waiting to see. Dividing Yemen into region means the fragmentation of Yemen. It is not in the interest of Yemenis. This is the implementation of a foreign agenda to divide and destroy the country. This is a well-organized plan from a number of Western and Arabic countries. And many politicians in the South had called for a federation of only two regions, which they argue would put them on more equal footing with the North while guaranteeing access to the country's oil resources. Joining me now live uh, to discuss this from Yemen, Sama Al Hamdani, a Yemeni analyst and researcher. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I want to start by asking you, what prompted this and why this six regions? 
Um, I'm sorry, I think you're cutting out a little bit. I'm uh, no happy to be here and I'm happy to talk Yemen's federal states. Um, six regions, it seems to be a convenient solution instead of a two-state solution. Um, mainly because if you look at Sudan, I think the international community is worried about Yemen being another scenario that's not going to work out. And you know, when we, when we talk about it not working out, we've seen the leaders in the south reject the announcement. Uh, and you know, in, in the north, Shia rebels are saying the proposed division uh, does not distribute wealth evenly. What are your biggest concerns and what do you make of those concerns? I'm concerned that the federal state solution is not looking at Yemen's problems realistically. Um, the biggest problems that are facing Yemen are economic, and to create a six, um, you know, six federal regions, it's going to require a lot of money because you have to create new governments, smaller parliaments, and Yemen's economy won't be able to handle that. Besides that, um, we're starting to have sectarian, ethnic, and uh, religious divisions amongst Yemenis, I'm very worried that these federal states are going to exacerbate that problem. Uh, rather than bring Yemenis together, it could lead to several civil wars, and that would be a real big problem. Besides the Houthis and um, the Southerners that you talked about, the Salafis are also opposed to this idea because they prefer a simple state. So there are a lot of opponents on the ground. However, the international community keeps on pushing for, for the six-state um, federal solution. Certainly. And, you know, to your point, you know, people are obviously reacting to this uh, on the ground in Yemen, but also online. There's a conversation around what this might mean for Yemen, for the region. Uh, some people poking fun as well. Carl Sharo saying Yemen has just become a federal republic of six regions. Amateurs, Lebanon is a federal republic of four million regions. You know, obviously, this is making a comparison between Yemen and Lebanon, but there does seem to be, uh, a, a, for lack of a better term, a trend in in the polarization of, of politics, also of, of communities and society and religion uh, in the region. What do you make of you know, this, this trend and, and what would be a better approach in your, in your mind? I mean, what is the biggest grievance here? Uh, is this a coup, for example, as some southern leaders are calling it? Um, I don't think it's a coup. I think what's happening is we're witnessing a lot of movements um, kind of take opportunity of uh, the lack of uh, presence of government in Yemen. For example, in Adala, there was uh, a Hirak movement and the government attacked them very harshly. In Hadramaut, there was an up a popular uprising called Al-Habba. In Shabwa, there was another popular uprising called uh, Al-Faz'a. Uh, in Tahama, there is a popular uprising calling for separation as well, or for um, more rights and benefits called the Hirak Tahami. And now in Damaj, you are witnessing the Houthis mm -hmm. trying to take control of the region. So what we're seeing is that there's a lack of national identity in Yemen and and the government's presence is very weak, which makes people look at other sectarian identities and cling on to them, which is going to lead to further conflict. So um, Yemen's biggest problems, in my opinion, are economic. 70% uh, of the population is uh, under the age of 25. Yeah. And a lot of these, these youth are unemployed. So the solution to me is to start by providing economic opportunities for these people, especially because these Yemeni youths are restricted in movement. Yeah. Almost the majority of countries in the world are not accepting any Yemeni um, immigrants or any even Yemeni tourists at this yeah. point. It's very hard to leave the country. And so the main employers are going to be AQAP, yeah. political parties and tribes. Well, and with Yemen's excessive amount of weapons, it could be very disastrous. And, and Sama, you raise really good points, you know, especially when you're you know, providing some of those statistics, which are true of Yemen, but also the entire region. You know, a large majority under the age of 29, uh, youth unemployment high, despite an educated uh, population. My question, though, you know, when we look, for example, at, at how this is being framed in the context of conflict, uh, you retweeted Adam Barron, who wrote, should we be referring to the clashes in North Yemen as the seventh Houthi war, perhaps the call should have been made months ago. Obviously, there are tensions, there are uh, obstacles to, uh, you know, providing uh, jobs and, and, you know, to, you know, for example, a lot of people looking at this uh, as not a priority for the country, but, but is there, are they mutually exclusive, this notion of uh, federalizing or, you know, these federations within Yemen and the government focusing and prioritizing uh, job growth and, and, you know, trying to increase those numbers. Do you see the two as, as, as mutually exclusive, if you will? I think that so far they've created uh, a solution that's not very clear. They've mm -hmm. declared the regions and their names, but they really haven't explained how the economic system is going to work. 
Um, I really don't think that it's going to be that successful because they haven't prepared for it on the ground very well. And the committee that came up with the solution was composed of 22 members, which already broke the 30 percent quota that the National Dialogue signed, in, signed up for. Um, and these same members were present throughout through Yemen's National Dialogue. Um, there were three things that were held back during Yemen's National Dialogue. It was the Southern issue, mm -hmm. the Sada conflict, and national uh, reconciliation and transitional justice. And until this very day, these three main topics seem to be unresolved. Right. Federation, to me, seems like a quick, convenient facelift for, um, for the Southern problem, which um, it's a political solution rather than an economical one. They're not really looking at and, and you know, the, the, the Southern problem is a humanitarian issue. Um, there's there are other solutions for it, and and because Sama, you bring up two different uh, you know points, you bring up the confusing nature of this uh, move, if you will, and you know let's look at a tweet which kind of echoes this. Anwar Muthana, tweeting saying, "New Yemen state map. I guess I'm part of the Aden region now," uh, and here is the map, you know, and, and him guessing that he's part of it. I think. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, it speaks directly to what you're talking about. But more importantly, you know, you talk about the, the north-south divide. I mean, there's long been a fear that that a straight north-south divide could set the stage for the south to to eventually secede. Do you do you share that fear? How real is it? What do you make of that? That is a fear. Um, as early as 1994, I think it was uh, Salem Saleh, who's a YSP leader, who called for a two-state federal solution. Uh, that that demand has been echoed, um, and then it was demanded on, in 2009 again by the, some of the southern Islahis, and then the National Dialogue came and adopted that as a solution. Um, there is absolutely a fear of secession, but dividing it into six federal states doesn't mean that they're not going to secede. Right. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you look at the map, the hugest portion was in Hadramaut, which was colored in red. They can still secede, and most of the wealth, which is the oil, is in that part of, of, of uh, Yemen. Right. So the Hadramaut region has has most of the oil. So they can still easily secede. The idea is that feder federalism can work, right? It's it's not a bad idea considering how many problems are in Yemen, um, how many ethnic and regional problems are already there. However, right. you want right. to do it very carefully. And because the solution was announced by regular individuals from the National Dialogue rather than legal experts, it makes you worry about whether this is actually a viable solution, or you know, is it just, again, a, a quick fix? And we're going to see the same problems happen in 10 years again. And Sama, I want to thank you uh, for sharing your insights with us, for joining us. For those of you who are interested in learning more, you could, of course, continue this conversation online. This is her Twitter handle, as you can see right here. Um, uh, a straight shooter, as she describes herself to be. Uh, very clear, clearly, clearly the case. Thanks again for being with us. Now we're going to Move along to Nanjing. This is where history is being made. China and Taiwan are holding official meetings for the first time since 1949. The face-to-face -face talks come as long-held tensions between the two sides have begun to ease in recent years. There's no official agenda for the historic talks, but it's anticipated that trade and the establishment of diplomatic offices on each other's soil will dominate the conversation. Now, press freedoms could also be a topic of discussion, given that China has recently denied accreditation to several media outlets that have been requesting permission to operate in the country. China and Taiwan, of course, have a very complicated history. Following the Chinese Civil War in 1949, uh, Chiang Kai-shek and more than two million Chinese citizens fled communist forces to establish an independent republic on the island. But China still claims the land as its own and has threatened to use force to uphold its claim should Taiwan ever seek official independence. Now, since the election of former Chinese President Hu Jintao, China has taken a less hostile approach towards Taiwan. In 2013, trade between the two countries had ballooned to nearly $2 billion, or I should say $200 billion. Now we head to Iran, where on Tuesday, millions of people rallied across the country to celebrate the 35th anniversary of the Islamic Revolution and the toppling of Shah Reza Pahlavi, once a close U.S. ally. Here is how President Rouhani himself marked the event. The pre-revolutionary regime deprived our people from the freedom to vote, from the freedom to express themselves. The people's vote 
had no role in the running of the country. This was a huge humiliation of a historic nation such as the Iranian nation. As is often the case, uh, people shouted down with America, down with Israel, death to President Obama and to John Kerry. Others carried signs saying, quote, we are eager for all options on the table, referring, of course, to U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry's recent remarks and, quote, we are ready for the great battle. Reports say rallies featured clowns explaining to children the importance of brushing their teeth and included reenactments of scenes from the war with Iraq. A man in Tehran told NBC News, quote, I have a message from the people of Iran to Mr. Obama and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. We are ready for big war. And unlike years past, Iran's supreme leader posted a video of the celebrations on Instagram. Check it out. I don't know if we have the sound up on this, but in the background you can hear uh, someone over the uh, loudspeaker as people shuffle through the streets. There you have it. Diplomacy or, or you know, PR or what have you in, in modern day age. All right, moving along, we go to Russia for an Olympics news update. The International Olympic Committee announced Tuesday it has lifted its suspension on India's participation in Sochi. Three Indian athletes are competing at the 2014 Olympics, and now they are no longer men without a country. Because of the suspension, the two skiers and one loser marched in the opening ceremony under the Olympic flag, identified only as independent Olympic participants. In December 2012, the Indian Olympic Association was suspended after a corruption-tainted official was voted in as the IOA's Secretary General. Now, this is the first time a National Olympic Association has been reinstated during the Games. India's flag will be raised in the Olympic Village, and the athletes can carry it during the closing ceremony on February 23rd. Now, Canada is near the top of the medal standings, but the country has already taken the gold for coolest Sochi gadgets. Team Canada's Olympic House has a beer fridge that only opens for Canadian passports. That's right, to get a beer from the machine, users have to scan a Canadian passport. Seems like a bit racist to me, but no, I'm just kidding. But originally, it was released last year in honor of Canada Day and installed around Europe. The fridge, which was created by Molson Canadian Brewing Company, uh, is, as you can imagine, uh, making fans very happy. Olympics fans are loving it. Rita uh, Batocchio tweeted this. Sweet, leave it to the Canadians, spotted the beer fridge in Canada, and there you have it. We also had a tweet from Rabbit. On Twitter, time to go home, everybody. Canada just won the Olympics with this incredible beer fridge. Uh, and we also have Jonah Carey, who gets into the competitive spirit, saying, wait, Americans don't have one of these? And Canada has its exclus exclusive beer fridge with that same photo. Well, Jonah, we agree. Time to step up your beer game, Team USA. You know how much we hate being one-upped by the Canadians. And finally, to the stands. Those of you watching the Olympic uh, Games on TV may have noticed a lot of empty seats in the venues. Women's hockey has seen the smallest crowds, uh, at times less than 50% of capacity. But these empty seats actually aren't the result of bad ticket sales. According to Olympic organizers, around 80% of ticket inventory has been sold. So what's the problem? Well, part of the problem is that ticket holders aren't showing up. It seems continued threats of terrorist attacks, up to four-hour lines, and a seeming lack of interest means certain events are playing to empty stands. Now, in the first two days of competition, as many as 4,000 people didn't get their butts in their seats. So what's the Olympic Committee to do? Well, this isn't the first time that a host country has had to fill the crowd. In fact, London and Vancouver's games had even more seats to fill, and London even brought in soldiers to sit in spectators' places. But Sochi is calling for volunteer workers to take these spots as part of a, quote, personal motivation program. However, it seems the TV cameras are still catching a lot of gleaming white seats. Joining us now on the phone, live from Sochi, uh, from the ice skating venue, is HuffPost Live's very own Alona Minkowski. Uh, Alona, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Ahmed. Great to hear your voice. You too. Well, you know, you've been attending events, and I'm curious, when we talk about, you know, attendance, what are you seeing? I mean, have you seen seat filling going on? 
Uh, you know, it's certainly been a little bit of a mixed bag. Some of the events that I've attended have been the more popular ones, uh, like figure skating, like the biathlon, like the short track competition. And so for the most part, I feel like the, the attendance has been pretty good, although right now I'm at the short, um, the short program competition for pairs in figure skating, and there's definitely some empty seats go around. Uh, but you know what's interesting, too, is, is, as you mentioned, it's not for lack of sales. I think that what happens is a lot of people, when they purchase tickets ahead of time, maybe months ahead of time or a year ahead of time, they buy them as a package deal. And, you know, that happens before you actually get to Sochi and figure out how things work here. For example, if you're trying to go to an event that's up in the mountains and you want to go be skiing or snowboarding on the same day, but you want to come down here and see speed skating or figure skating, you're going to have a really hard time doing that because it takes a long time to get around. It takes a couple of hours to get up there on the mountain, to get back here to the Olympic Park. And so I think that, you know, maybe some people just aren't showing up because they realize that it's just too hard to do all of it uh, at once. I personally haven't seen any four-hour lines, um, you know, but but no, it's not it's not crazy busy. Maybe maybe that's the problem, too, is that normally I just breeze right through. And I, that's a testament to the fact that there aren't all that many people here. Well, well, you are at the skating rink. I mean, talk to us a little bit more about it. You know, uh, the, the attendance aside, obviously, we've just discussed that this happens often. I mean, what's it like? What's the atmosphere like? Um, it's a great atmosphere. You know, the same thing that I was telling you yesterday is I'm, I, I just walked in. I was running a little bit late to go sit with uh, the people that I was with and happened to be a couple from New York sitting there right next to me. Uh, you know, so we started chatting, and so it's great to see an international crowd, and a lot of people are wearing the uniform or the, the colors of their countries that they're from, and so that obviously makes it uh, a little easier to tell who they're rooting for. But overall, it also makes it that much more of a fun and competitive environment that's, uh, you know, all in good spirits. People cheer, cheer for their team, but we're all here for the same thing, you know, which is just to see a good competition and to see some amazing performances. I uh, can't tell you too much about what's been going on with the pairs competition yet thus far. Um, there still are a lot of pairs left to go, but I think that uh, it's in China so far in the lead. Well, you know, we were looking at some of that footage uh, that you had shot from the rink, and I have to say, for as much as some of the seats look empty, I mean, it does seem very festive, and it has that Olympic aura. You know, I've never been, uh, obviously, you know, I'm jealous of the fact that you're there, but, but, but on a side note, Alona, you know, we talked about the Canada House and its news-making beer fridge. Um, have you tried to go to the American House? I did try to go to the American House, and I was turned away. Uh, but basically what happened is they explained it to me is that it's really just meant for friends and family of the athletes and those people that are on the USA team. Uh, and it's, it's a chill zone. You know, they have a nice lounge where people can actually watch the events on the big screen where you can eat, where you can get drinks and kind of relax. And, uh, you know, I guess I have a place to go chill for a little bit when you're not, so you don't have to be wandering all over the Olympic Park and the Olympic yeah. Stadium, but not everybody can go in. And the other thing is, you know, I did show them my American passport because I obviously tried to talk my way in, you know me. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I told the guy that I'd heard a rumor that maybe if you pay $300, you can be let in. And he said that I'm not the first person that had approached him with that. And for some reason, that rumor keeps floating around. But in order to go see just the store where they sell all of the Ralph Lauren American-made gear... Yeah. Or, you know, Team USA gear, you also need to have an American passport, which I think is, I think it's kind of, a, you know, a bad business decision because what if other people want to buy you? Right. Well, gear? Alona, talk about bad business decision. What if you want a beer and you're not Canadian? <laughs> Good point. I mean, there is definitely Russian beer to be found around <laughs> here. Like, like I said, sometimes they only sell the non-alcoholic version inside the venues, but you can get, uh, get a good Baltica outside in the middle of the park. Sounds like Qatar, not Russia. Uh, you know, not alcoholic <laughs> beer. What's going on? All right. Well, Lona, one more question before I let you go. Actually, what's your Russian beer? What's your favorite Russian beer? Why don't we just ask you that while you're here with us? Oh, my favorite Russian beer? I don't know. It's a tough one. I feel like I'm not uh, as well versed in my Russian beers as I need to be. Okay, well, you have time. Baltica, the, well, the one, the, one that they, uh, the one that they sell here at Baltica is really just a basic Russian beer. It's kind of like the Budweiser the Budweiser of Russia, and uh, it does the trick. It's good. So, so, so very quickly, uh, let's talk about security again before I let you go. I'm told you had an interesting experience after getting off the train. 
<laughs> oh, you know, I hope I don't get any any of these poor volunteers. Uh, they're the people that are dressed in those colorful Sochi outfits that are helping all the tourists around and making sure you know where you're going. I hope I don't get any of them in trouble. But when I was up on the mountain the other day to go see the biathlon, uh, you know, we came up by car instead of by train. And so then kind of confusing. Our car didn't really know where to drop us off. We kept asking. We kept getting directed in another way. And so once we got dropped off, we realized that we were really close to the uh, the athletes Olympic Village. And so they were nice enough then to shuttle us over to where the biathlon competition was going on. And on the walk back, our car was waiting for us in the same spot for God knows what reason. And we made it all the way to the athletes Village just by telling them repeatedly, you know, telling people like, yeah, we're going over here, we're going over here, we've got a car waiting. And we almost made it up to the building until finally some volunteers figured us out. Maybe it's because the, the guilty looks on our faces <laughs> or maybe it was because our passes clearly uh, did not say that we were athletes. But we were also dressed in in some Russia gear, so I think that maybe that helped us around a little bit. Yeah, well, I would definitely stop you if I saw you trying to get in somewhere, just for the record. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I thought I was in. I thought that was my moment. I was going to get to go hang out and, uh, you know, get to know some of the athletes. Well, um, well. speaking of your moment, I hope you have more of an opportunity to try that beer, uh, even if it's hard to come by. Look at my screen. This is it, the Baltica beer that you were talking about. Certainly doesn't look wintry, or um, I guess I hear Sochi, though. It can, it can look wintry, and then it can also look beachy in the same day. So, Alona, thanks for the updates. Uh, we'll, we'll be uh, back with you soon, I'm sure. Okay, thanks. Now we head to Switzerland, which could lose privileged access to the European free trade area after Swiss voters narrowly backed a controversial anti-immigration law curtailing immigrants from the European Union. Now the right-wing Swiss People's Party initiated the vote on Sunday, which tapped into concerns that Swiss culture is being eroded by foreigners who make up almost 25% of the country's 8 million strong population. Now, business leaders, uh, the Swiss government and EU officials are seeking punitive measures against Swiss goods into the European market. Many, like France's foreign minister, Laurent Fabius, are hardly impressed by the vote. It means that Switzerland wants to withdraw into itself. It's partly a current trend, but it's also paradoxical because 60% of Switzerland's external trade is with the European Union, and it lives very largely off the EU. And a satirical German news site released this image in a blog post, which is quickly spread on social media. See, it shows what the highly regarded Swiss national soccer team would look like were it unable to select players from immigrant backgrounds. Now, the Swiss team qualified first in its group for the 2014 World Cup, and it is in no small part due to a new generation of talented young immigrants, including Gohan Inler, who is ethnically Turkish, Zerdan Shakiri, an Albanian superstar born in former Yugoslavia. Very quickly, let me just flip through just to show you. There you have without them, and there you have with them. So, pretty, pretty stark contrast there. Well, meanwhile, here is what the European Commission had to say. This and this does indeed run counter to the principle of free movement of persons between the EU and Switzerland. And as to our overall relations with Switzerland, the EU is obviously going to look at the implications of this. Now, this isn't the first time the Swiss People's Party reveals their prejudice through legislation. In the past, the Swiss People's Party spearheaded initiatives to ban burqas and the construction of minarets in the country. Now we go to Vancouver, Canada, where two new vending machines downtown are selling crack pipes instead of Butterfingers. A Canadian nonprofit organization installed the crack pipe vending machines in Vancouver with the aim of curbing the spread of HIV and hepatitis among drug users. The two polka dot vending machines, which sell pipes for just 25 cents each, have become quite the hit. The machines hold 200 pipes, are restocked every five days, and one of the machines, the one we've shown you here, is located in the center. This isn't the first harm reduction program in the city, although Canada's federal government doesn't recognize the program as a legitimate means for combating drug use. Also, in 2011, the Vancouver Coastal Health Authority launched a pilot program handing out pipes in the city's downtown Easton for free. Kaylin C., director of the Drug Users Resource Center, explains why they've installed the machines. What this does um, 
is it sort of devalues, it, it decreases the street value of a pipe, which is what we're trying to do. We packaged a crap pipe in polka dots. It was, people were very intrigued by it and wondered what it was, and, and, um, and it, was, it was kind of a hit right away, yeah. Polka dots a hit right away. Well, she also said the aim is that by offering clean pipes for such a low price, the plan will devalue the smoking devices across the board. And finally, staying in Canada, we go to Toronto, where on Monday, Mayor Rob Ford launched a new YouTube series called Ford Nation. Because why not? And in one of his inaugural videos, he admitted he lied about his drug use. Take a listen. How about if I ask you the question? Yeah. I'll pretend I'm one of the reporters. Okay. Okay, I'll go. play hardball. Go for it. Toronto Mayor Rob Ford's already an online sensation, so it was only really a matter of time before he cashed in on his fame possibly to buy booze and crack pipes. Anyway, that day has come with the launch of Ford Nation, Rob Ford, the YouTube channel. We've been hoping for Bob Marley sing-alongs. So you get the idea. You might remember that Ford has been under scrutiny since May 2013 when two reporters revealed the existence of a video which claimed to show him smoking crack. Ford initially denied the accusations and suggested the video did not exist. But he later admitted to the claims in November. And a new video channel called Ford Nation Rebuttal has already posted clips of the mayor's scandals and controversial statements. Of course they did. Can you blame them? That's all for World Brief for today. You can join the conversation, as always, by leaving a comment in our resource well. You could also tweet the stories you're following to me at ASC. You could use the hashtag World Brief. Um, and for those of you who want to listen to World Brief on the go, uh, you can download the podcast on iTunes or SoundCloud. Stay tuned, much more coming up on HubPost Live.